Okay, so we're here today to interview Bob Schaefer. Uh, the interviewer, in, uh, as usual, will be William McRae, and uh, we are in uh, downtown Toronto. Uh, so we're going to begin just with a few simple questions. So could you please state your full name? Okay, I'm Robert William Schaefer. Generally go by Bob, because there were so many mix-ups with my father, who was Robert Martin Schaefer, and he got called Rob. Okay, so you're, you're Robert Jr. <laughs> no, he had a different middle name, but, yeah. but that's okay. Um, and uh, could you please state your age? I just turned 62. Happy birthday. Oh, yes. And uh, where were you born? I was born in Chicago, Illinois. And uh, as a child, what did uh, your parents do? Uh, my father was in marketing, and my mother had been a, a, one of the first flight attendants. And in those days, they had to retire when they got married, and so at age 25 or so, she retired as a flight attendant and became my mother. Okay. And uh, did you have any siblings? I've got a brother and two sisters, both young, all of them younger. And what did you guys do for, uh, for fun when you were children? What was your hobby, your pastimes? Uh, what did I do for fun? I played all the sports, everything. Summertime was baseball, fall was football, winter was hockey. Uh, I started playing golf when I was about 12, 13. I still play basketball, I still play golf. Uh, so up until last year, I continued playing softball as well. Okay. And any, um, any interests in the sciences or? Um, I didn't know it, but yes, I was collecting fossils and okay. pretty rocks and things like that through grade school. and. Had no concept of even what geology was until I'd gotten later in high school and still didn't think that was what I wanted to do. I thought I was going to be a lawyer. Okay, yeah. Not so, well, I, that's... so I started my first semester in university taking pre-law type courses and I'd had the basic sciences through high school and so you had to take a science program. So I said geology kind of integrates chemistry, physics, biology, so I decided I'd take geology the first semester, and lo well, and behold, that was what I got my best grades in, and I enjoyed the most. Okay. And uh, so f so from there, what did your bachelor turn out to be? Uh, was it still pre-law, or did no. you completely? No. Next semester, I switched it to geology, and so I had a geology major and German minor. Okay, interesting. Yeah, my German just seemed to come to me easily. I, I, I don't hear that a lot, but uh, good for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, where, which school was it? I went to Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. And that, I guess what made me a little strange is I was growing up at that time, the Vietnam War was going on, so I was uh, subject to the U.S. draft. And I drew a draft lottery number of four, so I thought I was going to be drafted and go into Vietnam. And so when I realized that, I accelerated my coursework thinking, well, I knew I wouldn't get drafted for at least 18 months. And in that 18 months time, I took as much coursework as I could to get as close to my degree as I possibly could. Well, four days before I was to be inducted, Nixon ended the draft, and I was one semester away from graduation. So I finished a full bachelor's BSc in geology in three years. And with Knowing that, I didn't really know what kind of geology I wanted to specialize in, so I played both sides of the fence with uh, mining geology or economic geology and petroleum and applied to graduate schools in both areas and decided I'd, I'd go into the, the economic geology side. And so I decided to stay at Miami of Ohio, got a master's degree there in two years with a thesis. Uh, one of the first gold theses since the price of gold allowed to float back in 1974. And so I went from Ohio to Nevada to work at a gold mine. And finished the degree in 1975 and went on to work on a PhD. Minoring in mineral economics. No longer German. You had to have a Fortunately, you had to have a foreign language to get a PhD, so I'd already completed that requirement by having that German background. So what was your first, uh, what would you consider your first job? First job I got paid to do as a geologist. 
scientist? Yeah, in your field. In my field, okay. And, and what was to be your future? Okay, well, I, I did get a stipend from the company I did my master's thesis at, which was a small underground gold and silver mine in Nevada. Uh, but then, let me think. My first real paying job was as a summer student working for Rio Tinto up in Alaska and spent the summer mapping a world-class porphyry molly deposit in southeast Alaska, not far from Ketchikan, uh, and continue, then even turned that into a, a consulting gig while I was in grad school. So I continued, while I was still taking classes and doing thesis research, consulting about 10 hours a week or wow. so, making about a, about $70 an hour. I was going to say <laughs> consulting at such a young age. And so it's impressive. It, it frustrated one professor in particular because yes, I had a full scholarship to go com completing grad school. And he liked to use that as his hold as um, grad students to kind of make them their working slaves. But I was making more money as a consultant, but I was getting good enough grades they couldn't take my my, my stipends away, so I was making 35, 40,000 a year as a student <laughs> and living a pretty good life. With the scholarship, too. Yeah. Um, what kind of consulting did you do? Um, what are examples? Yeah, well, because I, I was in school, I really couldn't go out and leave the university very much, so I did a lot of uh, microscope work, core logging, in the, and, and that sort of thing, evaluation of structural analysis and that sort of thing. And did you, uh, you mentioned your, consider your first job to be up in Alaska. Yeah. Um, a lot of people I speak to, either they fall in love with kind of the, the surveying environment, mm -hmm. uh, the exploration environment, or the opposite. They okay. realize that's really not what they, yeah. they want to do. How about you? It was both. I, I, <laughs> seriously, I, I worked as a exploration geologist and exploration manager until I was in my early 40s. So I spent a lot of time in the field all the way up until I was about 43, 44 years old. Then I uh, got my first job as a mining executive when I, I moved from being the, re the U.S. Exploration Manager for BHP living in Salt Lake City to Vice President of Exploration uh, with the original management team at Kinross Gold. So I moved, that's when I first started doing a lot in Canada. It's, I moved here at that time. Okay. And then I've been at more or less the executive level since then. Um, and, and briefly, could you um, give us kind of the outlines of your sure. your career? And then we'll go into detail. Okay. Well, while I was in finishing grad school at Arizona, I worked as a consultant largely for U.S. Borax, Rio Tinto, a couple of other companies. I worked for Conoco Minerals. I worked for uh, Occidental Minerals. Um, who else? Mapco Coal Corporation. And then when I finished school, I, my first job was with uh, Billiton Metals and Ores. Their U.S. subsidiary and was based in Reston, Virginia, where the U.S. Geological Survey is headquartered because they were just setting up a presence in the United States. And I essentially evolved to being their senior geologist responsible for Appalachian geology. And we made two modest discoveries, a tin discovery in North Carolina and a copper discovery in northern Alabama, of all places. Uh, shortly after that, I was then transferred to Reno, Nevada, where I initiated the first gold exploration program Billiton had ever done in the, you know, on a worldwide basis, looking at uh, looking for Carlin style and volcanic hosted gold deposits. And while I did that, I had it occurred to me as I was driving across the country, there were no books that researched the geology of those styles of gold deposits. So as I'm driving across the flatlands of the central, central U.S., I wrote an outline for a book and took it to the Geological Society of Nevada and said we should, what we should do is uh, put on a symposium on these microscopic gold deposits and sediments and volcanic rocks and then come up with a publication out of it. And it evolved into a 700-page into a book 
a three-day symposium that netted them over a million dollars and set the organization up on a permanent financially sound basis. And since that time, the Geological Society of Nevada has held such a conference every five years. Wow. So that was kind of exciting. Yeah. At that time as well, I led a small exploration team. We made us a modest gold discovery too small for the Billiton organization, so I took it over myself and did a little more exploration work out of my own pocket, optioned it to a Canadian junior company, and we put it into production. So that was my first discovery as well. What's considered a modest discovery? Oh, we found about a 300,000 ounce gold deposit, open pit uh, Carlin style deposit. For about a half a dozen years, it produced 60,000 ounces a year. and. Uh, was the lowest one of the lowest cost gold producers in the state of Nevada for, for that time frame. So it was pretty pretty exciting because I got a royalty kickoff out of it. Yeah. And uh, so out of all the, I mean, it's quite a prolific. Uh, that, well, that was just the beginning. Just the beginning. Okay, yeah, go on. That, go on. That, Sorry. That, take, that takes me to 1988. Okay. So in in 1988, a Kentucky West Virginia based coal company who specialized in open-cut coal mining back there, so was enamored with gold. They said, well, open-pit coal mining can't be that much harder than open-pit gold mining. Why don't we get into gold? And they, they recruited me to set up a gold company for them in Reno. And within 18 months, I made an acquisition for them on a uh, Cairn maintenance gold mine up in Montana that what we put into production a year later. Uh, we grew the res reserves from about 200,000 ounces to over a million ounces in that time frame as well with an intense drilling program. Made a discovery in Southern California called the Briggs Mine, currently operated by Canyon Resources, that, finally, that went into production in 1992 and is still producing. And made a discovery, another discovery in Montana called McDonald, which is a five million ounce deposit, but the state of Montana decided they didn't like cyanide usage in gold recovery, so they passed a state law specifically focused on that deposit so it wouldn't go into production. So that was kind of interesting. That last, well, the, gold, the coal company decided after about 24 months that they didn't really want to be in gold after all. They didn't see it really being analogous. We had spent probably about $20 million do, getting all these things moving and sold the company for over a hundred million dollars. So they were happy, I was happy, and uh, I went into a, a short term of consulting because gold was in a downturn at the time and you, somehow you always seem to lose your job just at the wrong moments. Yeah, no, it's a very it, cyclical. Yeah, um, it's a, it, yeah, it seems to work that way. Anyway, I let me make sure I get this order correctly. So I got 1991, 92, and that's when BHP knocked on my door. They said they needed a new U.S. exploration manager and hired me and moved me from Reno to Salt Lake City, which was the kind of historical headquarters for BHP because, because at that time it was called BHP Utah International, which had been a coal company, and BHP being an Australian major, still wanted to have a, a strong presence in North America and based it out of Salt Lake City. That's where I worked from then. And that's where I kind of became enamored with that city and really liked living there. Okay. I stayed with BHP from 92 till 95 when uh, Kinross contacted me and said well, I'd consider moving to Toronto and becoming their first VP of exploration. And I said, of course. <laughs> And that's when I became involved uh, with the PDAC at the same time. I moved up here in July. By October, um, the executive director of the PDAC had heard about me, so he called me and said, let's have lunch. And I told him how I'd worked with the Geological Society of Nevada and set them up. He said, well, you should do things with us as well. And I got involved with planning the con convention on an annual basis from essentially 95 until just a couple of years ago. So uh, while at Kinross, we made other discoveries. We 
got involved with, uh, initially I was just looking at exploration in the mine areas because that's really what they wanted was production type exploration. And then we took over Amax Gold, which opened Kinross up from a company that operated essentially in the Timmins, Kirtland Lake area, and in um, Zimbabwe to acquiring a gold, operating gold mine in Alaska at Fort Knox, in Far East Russia at the Kubaka mine, and in Chile at the, the Refugio mine. And uh, we made a small discovery extending an ore body. Oh, they also had a mine in BC. I forgot about that, the QR mine. Interestingly, the mine manager called me one day, said, we've only got nine months of reserves left in front of us and don't have anywhere to turn. Can you come out and help us find something? <laughs> so I went out there for 10 days to study the geology, geochemistry, and geophysics and came up with an exploration plan. And our first eight holes were dis discoveries in a new ore body. Huh. So we extended the mine life by another two years. Uh, but that, at that point in time, the mine became, was no longer of interest and we sold it. Similarly, the mine that we acquired in Russia was a very high-grade open pit mine called Kubaka. Well, it only had five years of mine life left in it. And at the first board meeting, uh, the chairman said, Bob, we need you to find another identical ore body that can, that's within trucking distance of this place that's a thousand kilometers from the nearest town. And I said, well, there's only a couple of ways to do that. And, one of, and the way that I thought would be most efficient was to essentially try to cooperate with the Russian government, get access to the historic exploration data that they'd collected in the region, show the Russians and have them fully integrated into how to import that and interpret it in a GIS type system, define exploration targets, and then do a rapid evaluation of what turned out to be 45 targets that we identified in a, in a six month period of data analysis by hopscotching teams in two helicopters on a rotating basis. And uh, by the next uh, onset of winter, we had identified three targets we wanted to drill. Now there'd never been a winter drilling program in remote Russia ever before, and we set out to do that as well. And we, this first program was location was about 60 kilometers away from the mine, and it, did, it was a duster, it didn't work out. The second project, however, uh, was a target that we'd identified as a result of some stream sediment geochemistry, some interpretation of distal rock alteration underneath a glacially covered area in a stream valley. And our first drill hole found mineralization virtually identical to the mine. We, we drilled, uh, over a period of two years, we drilled enough holes in that valley to define a little over a million ounces at almost 20 grams per ton in an open pit configuration. And that became a five-year extension to the mine life that they asked me to do. So inside of 18 months, I've made two discoveries for them kind of by the seat of the pants because I was put under pressure saying, we need you to find it now. <laughs> um, then, Ken Ross decided they wanted to have a, a research office in Salt Lake City because that's one of their founding locations as well. That's how they'd learned about me. So they said, why don't you go back and head up that office for a while? And we learned very quickly that uh, the chairman CEO didn't really like having one of his direct reports that far away, so we decided to part paths, but that didn't hurt too much, and that five days later, the Hunter Dickinson group in Vancouver called me and said, would you like to join us? And that was uh, in 2004. I became vice president of business development for them, and I stayed with, but I told them at that point in time, my wife was the manager of a giant Macy's department store. And so finding an equivalent job for her in Vancouver would have not been possible. So I said, You're not, you don't have to give up your career. I'll, 
I got Hunter Dickinson to agree that I should just commute on a weekly basis. So I'd get on a plane every Sunday evening, and usually for the first six years, I'd fly home on Friday evening. That only left me one, one and a half days at home. Well, we, I start, we kind of realized not a lot of work gets done on Friday. So instead, I'd fly home on Thursday night, and so I'd have Friday, Saturday, and fly back again on Sunday. Anyway, during that time, I moved from Vice President of Business Development to, uh, they changed titles around and became Senior Business Development Executive and finally Executive Vice President of Hunter Dickinson. And during that time, we made a number of acquisitions that I was involved with, notably the Burnstone Gold Deposit in South Africa, um, the Olza zinc lead deposit in, in Poland, the uh, Florence in situ leach copper project in southern Arizona. Um, let me think. I know there's one or two more and my brain's not clicking in. <laughs> anyway, so we, anyway, we continued growing the company. Uh, Amali tungsten deposit in New Brunswick called Sisson. Um, uh, a VMS zinc lead copper gold deposit in southeast Alaska and, and so on. So we, we generally had about one reasonable acquisition per year over a 10 year period. And then this past, as this downturn got deeper and deeper beginning in 2008, finally this year, um, it made logical sense I should just move along because there were, there were no resources left to do another acquisition left in Hunter Dickinson. They had enough, they had their plate full of projects and not enough money to support them. So we, we made an agreement that I would no longer make the commute. I'll, my title will switch from EVP to executive advisor and I can, I'm free really to do whatever I want and they'll call me if they want some advice on things. And that's where we are today. And that's where you are. So, so would you be semi-retired? <laughs> people I talk to retire, but they don't really retire. No, no. <laughs> geologists, mining people don't retire. We're having too much fun. Yeah. Uh, so last year, I made an attempt with a, 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 a couple of other uh, mining engineer and a financial guy. We joined created uh, an executive team that made a bid to acquire a nickel copper project from Rio Tinto that was located in northern Michigan. Uh, unfortunately, our bid came in about 10 million shy, and so uh, the Lundin Corporation ended up buying the Eagle project. Uh, currently, I'm working on three other acquisitions and uh, having a lot of fun doing it. We're about to made an attempt to acquire Barrick's Cowell Gold Project in Australia. We put in an offer of $450 million cash, and it wasn't quite enough either. <laughs> Having said that, uh, we believe they, the group that got it overpaid substantially for it, and I'm working on, like I say, three others now. Okay. So one of them's gonna stick to the wall. Yeah. <laughs> And is there any consulting? Or? Uh, a little bit. I'm doing some expert witness work uh, in, a, in a dispute between two joint venture partners okay. that should will probably go to arbitration or a court ruling. Um, that must be interesting. That'll, that'll be fun. Yeah, I've not done that. I just completed uh, the program at the Rotman Business School uh, Institute of Corporate Directors, so I'm planning to evolve more to a corporate directorship position uh, with, with major companies instead of junior companies. So that it, uh, and so I think what I hopefully will do is complete one more acquisition that gives me an operating company and get on one or two quality company boards and, and move forward until whenever the time is right. <laughs> um, out of all your, um your jobs, I mean, there were a lot. Um, can you think of one or a few that were, at times, dysfunctional? Dysfunctional. I can think of some dysfunctional management teams. Okay. I'm not sure I want to name, <laughs> name names per yeah. se, but uh, 
sometimes the maybe perhaps an example of, an example of this, sure. this dysfunctionality sure. um, one of the companies that I worked with carried out a, a merger between itself and another operating company well the CEO chairman considered himself uh, an acquisitions expert as well and yes he'd made good acquisitions but he essentially considered due diligence, particularly on the technical side, to be just a perfunctory sort of thing that didn't mean anything. So usually when you carry out due diligence on operating mines, it's a, you send a full team and evaluate for two to five days to see how it's operating, where there might be problems and that sort of thing. He would assemble his team. We'd visit two or three mines in a day. <laughs> So really there wasn't a true due diligence analysis on the operation. He just wanted to get the deal done so he could move on to the next activity. And that's probably not the best way to take care of the shareholder's money. And in the long run, there were, was it a there, mistake? Or? Um, at a couple of the operations, yes, they needed to have some major capital, inf capital infusions to, to write some bad things. But... Uh, a couple that were all, a couple of them were also okay. So it was it? it I guess it balanced, yeah. but it wasn't right. Okay. Um, you've uh, you've traveled a lot. I mean, you've, uh, yeah. you've worked a lot uh, around the globe. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned you know Africa, South America, Russia, Australia. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the question is: Are there any notable areas, and were there any? major differences you saw um, on how a mine functions in Russia, for example, compared to any mine in Canada? Well, there, the way the permitting process and the exploration uh, governance by the country's government certainly is, is different. I, I guess I'm, one of the things I'm most notable for or notorious for was carrying out a due diligence in Afghanistan in 2008-2009. I made six trips to Afghanistan the project was called the INAC Copper Project, located about 150 kilometers south of Kabul, in the same area where Osama bin Laden was hiding out. In fact, I went into his cave. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there were that, there were some tense times. We walked around the area and you see, uh, some unexploded bombs and shells around and things like that. <laughs> yeah, I've worked in about 75, 80 different countries, wow. and so, um, again, we were one, at BHP, we were one of the first people in China back in the early 90s, and it was, it, how should I say, you knew that one of the, your guides and translators worked for the Chinese equivalent of the CIA, and he would spend every night trying to get me drunk so he could pump me for question, pump me with questions of, about things I shouldn't talk about, and that was always interesting sparring with him. <laughs> <laughs> um, did did the uh, did the mine <clears throat> ever become? Uh, it's not a mine in Afghanistan. We, we, Hunter Dickinson looked at this as the the best second place finish we ever had. Okay. We gained global recognition for the quality of the work we had done, but the Chinese put money under the table and got the bid. And then the Chinese proceeded then to try to change the terms of their deal, and the, and the, mine, and the property is still in suspension, nothing's happened really. And the Afghanistan government still to this day continues to contact me to ask for advice or ask me to try, want to come back again, but I've Largely give them advice, but I'm not going back right now. <laughs> um, you're, uh, I mean, you're clearly well versed in uh, mineral economics. Um, you, you had talked a bit about them, but uh, what are some of the major acquisitions that that? Uh, I think you, we talked a little bit about yeah. a lot of those at, at, at Kinross and, and Hunter Dickinson in particular. What and are I, what are I guess what are the the largest or the or your proudest? Proudest, jeez. Not all of them have come to fruition at this point. I think the 
One that's going to be the most, the ones that are going to be the most interesting will include the Florence in situ leach copper project in Arizona and that will be really the first of its type in that uh, a major, a, a full-size porphyry copper deposit uh, has, was oxidized so that the, the sulfide copper turned to oxide copper which means it's leachable by acid. It's in a perfect environment for, rather than just making a hole and digging it up, you drill holes into it, infuse the rock with uh, very weak acid, it's weak enough that you could drink it without serious problems. <laughs> uh, by keeping the, you inject the, the solution into one hole and it's surrounded by five other holes, as long as you're sucking up more than you're pushing in, you can control the flow direction of, of those solutions so that the water, the, that acid never gets out of your, the sphere of your activity and so you're able to recover all the copper without ever digging a hole. Wow. And so what, and when it's finished, you backfill the old drill holes with cement and it could become a, sub, uh, a subdivision or a shopping mall or whatever and no, del no deleterious effects. Almost, it's more like a, like a, a petroleum technique almost. Just to, to a degree it is, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. huh. Interesting. And so it'll be the first of its kind to, to make it all the way to commercial production. It's, we've experimented with it and it works very well. Uh, the other one that's going to be quite interesting, I think, is uh, the Olza zinc lead deposit in Poland. That area is one of the oldest mining camps in the world. It's been, they've been actually recovering zinc and lead from that area for a thousand years. Um, the quality of the zinc and lead, there, there are no impurities in it and so the concentrate that will be produced from this will can be blended with the, with other types of concentrates to improve their the overall quality. It's like diluting the bad stuff by putting more good stuff in. And uh, it's a neat little underground, it'll be a neat little underground operation. Prop Again, back to the world-class size, in excess of 100 million ton type underground mine, so it'll be a, a plus 40 year mine. Oh. Um, I have a few social questions for sure. you um, that I like to ask uh, most people I interview. Um, one would be about uh, women. Um, the, the, what, what was the, or how present or absent were women uh, throughout your career? In, uh, Okay. How did that change? All right. When I first, when I took my first job at um, Billiton, there were no women on the technical staff at all. But I had an exploration office working in the south, in uh, Alabama, Georgia, North and South Carolina, and we decided to do a, a very large regional geochemical sampling program. Well. We put, pulled together a team of eight summer students, and I made sure half of them were women. And the subsequent year, the project geologists that were our full-time staff people moved on to new things, and I just essentially hired one of the women to become the project manager for that project thereafter. So I've, I think I've been at the early stages of, of having women doing field work with the rest of the guys. Uh, at this point in time, I'm mentoring three young women who are uh, just finishing university or still in university. We talk probably about once a month about the things that uh, where they feel like they've had setbacks or directions mm -hmm. they might go. Um, provide some of my network names to them as well so they are able to build their own networking capabilities also. Um, at BHP, my office comprised one, two, three, four women as, as field geologists. Out of how many? Out of, out of 12. Okay. And that's still more than the, uh, the, the norm? That, that's about stats. a third. Yeah, yeah. The norm is about 20, 22% if I remember correctly. And so we were up in the, in the one third range. Um, and what, uh, what kind of, um, or if there were any, were there any, um, setbacks or um, 
did women have a hard time in the field work um, surrounded by mostly men or joining a, a man's um, job or environment? None that I ever observed in the groups that I've managed. I was very lucky that the guys were also quite mature about <laughs> dealing with dealing with uh, having a woman as part of their part of their working team. Okay. And on the diversity committee at the CIM currently, one of the founding members there, and I participate regularly in women in mining activities in the U.S. I've participated in women in mining uh, programs that have gone to Washington, D.C. to lobby congressional leaders and that sort of thing as well. I'd tease them that I was their mascot, but <laughs> it was all part of, part of trying just to get, a, get the job done to inform uh, government leaders as to what mining really was about. And do you see the... Um the trend of women uh, working in those jobs increasing, or? I think uh, it's going to increase a bit more. I don't think it'll ever really exceed maybe about 30, 35% at any given time because uh, the style of work uh, oftentimes doesn't fit the, the ambitions that many women have either. It requires a lot of travel, being in remote places and that sort of thing, and and this is going to sound bad, but a lot of women just w wouldn't enjoy doing that stuff. From my from what discussions I have with them, um, as for another question, um, I guess social question, mm -hmm. and, and you could give a bit of insight on the um, U.S. side of it, but um, I like to ask as well if. If you think there is a disconnect between mining or natural resource industry in general and society, media, people, certainly, um, a, and 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 what? How do you see it? Um, a lot of people in today's world think electricity comes out of the wall, and water comes out of the tap, and gasoline comes out of the pump. And cars just come out of showrooms. <laughs> and they, there's, there's been a, a strong disconnect as to the sources of all those things that make their lives comfortable. Uh, one of the things I'm planning to do as the incoming president of the PDAC is uh, promote a, a cooperative public outreach program to remind the, the population of Canada who are really quite knowledgeable about mining anyway, they realize that Canada is a natural resource focused economy, remind them that their, their quality of life is, has been based on and derived from the natural resources industries. But I think a little reminder periodically is, is an appropriate thing. There's probably a greater disconnect in the US. Oh yeah? By far. Uh, How so? Is it just because the gen most of the population is less uh, surrounded by those resources, or to some degree, the U.S. is uh, I won't say more urbanized than Canada because most Canadians live in larger cities, but the U.S. urban areas are are certainly disconnected from the sources of those natural resources. And uh, a vocal minority gets a much larger theater to play at as well. So uh, there's probably far less appreciation of where the natural resources that make their lives comfortable come from. One of the things I like about Salt Lake City, it's a city in the mountains. We got mountains on both sides of the city. And on the western side, within the city limits, is the largest copper mine in the North America. It's a big open pit copper mine that you can see the dumps from. It's been operating since 1903, called Bingham Canyon. They've mined over five billion tons of rock out of the hole, so it can be seen from the moon. And there's never been a, an environmental disaster of any sort in that 100 plus years of activity within the city limits of Salt Lake. And uh, in fact, back in the 60s and 70s, when I was a kid, uh, 
you know, Sunday night TV was, you know, Lassie and uh, Bonanza and that sort of thing. Well, on Sunday night in Salt Lake City, after Bonanza, they had the Kennecott week Sunday night move, family movie. And, and it would be sponsored by the mine. The first 15 minutes was statistics of what went on at the mine that week in terms of, you know, how many tons of ore were moved okay. and how much metal got produced and if there was an accident or not. And keep you informed. And then, and then the mine, were, then the movie would start 15 minutes after nine and go commercial free for the rest of the evening. Hmm. So they kept the people informed in Salt Lake City what, what this mine meant to their economy. So that's a good example, uh, but I've heard people in the mining business say, mm -hmm. who say, yeah, it goes both ways. Uh, there could be a lot more done by a lot of the natural resource companies oh, oh, and yeah. industry itself to, to actually educate young kids or, or, or anybody well, really. To, certainly. Well, to, sh to show this, that, that this community what they out actually do. This public outreach program that I'm talking about uh, starting to implement would focus at various demographics. I'm thinking you probably need a message that goes to the grade school, middle school age crowd the late high school, university age crowd to the late 20s, and then another message that goes to the working working adults as well, so that each one gets a, kind of the same information but presented in a fashion that communicates with them better. Uh, and there has been a lot of, uh, well not a lot, but the formative, formative portions of public outreach, PDAC and NCIM both have great programs with Mining matters and mining for uh, mining for society in, in the respective organizations, and they educate the teachers and the school kids about what natural resources mean to them, and they make it uh, fun with exercises that are carried out at school or at our conventions and that sort of thing. Um, I can think of uh, the state of Arizona has hired on the, on the staff of the University of Arizona a former high school teacher and geologist and she has developed a whole curriculum of things to, to teach at various grade levels and each year visits more than 5,000 students in the state and gets a day at you know probably 70 schools during the school year to to go through the school and teach at different levels for a, a period about what mining does for their, for their lifestyles and for the state of Arizona. That kind of thing would, might not be a bad model to go elsewhere with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Um, uh, I know we're... Yep. I think, I think we need to communicate better with the media itself. I think media likes to sensationalize things. And it's kind of their job at the same time. <laughs> true, but it's not bad to have sensational good news as well, or less biased at, at times. And having a news commentator who understands where these resources come from, not just the story itself, so that they can make a little more uh, accurate judgment as to what's going on when an event occurs, rather than relying on the hysterics at times that occur. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I know we're, yes, we're, we're tight. running short on time, yep. so I'll ask you, I'll just finish oh, with sure. a few Whatever quick questions. Like. Uh, one being, um, we can split it in two if it makes it easier, mm -hmm. but what are you proudest of in, in life? And you could go life in general and professional. Okay. Or? I think I'm proudest of the wonderful marriage I have with my wife, Patty. Uh, being married is an exploration and Field geologist, business development guy means you're on the road a lot, and we've worked. We've got a, I think, a pretty functional and understanding relationship. No matter where I am in the world, I call her at least once every day, and I mean, I called her from Afghanistan every day that I was there. I've called her from uh, <laughs> a helicopter crash in Siberia one time in a snowstorm, um, things like that. The, but. That way she knows what I'm up to. She knows, she feels like she's part of my side of life and I feel like I know what's going on at home and so she feels like I'm contributing to uh, hard decisions when, she, when she's there by herself. And that seems to really work and so it's a, it's a mutually supportive situation. I'm really happy with that. 
Um, I think probably the thing I enjoy most about my career has been the feeling I have giving back. I like the volunteer activities that I do quite a bit. So being involved with the Geological Society of Nevada early in my career, the SME in the U.S., which is the equivalent of CIM, I've been on their board for 15 years. Being involved with the PDAC and the CIM here in Canada and with the Mining Hall of Fame, all of those things, they probably eat 20 to 40 hours a week of my time in the evenings, but that keeps me out of trouble every night <laughs> when I'm away from home too, because I can work on, I've always got something I can work yeah. on. But it's very f exciting to see programs come come to fruition. We'll, uh, we'll finish with one question, and that's um, one of the favorite ones I like to ask is, if you were talking to someone uh, much younger, mm -hmm. a student for example, uh, what would be your one uh, important life lesson or piece of advice you could give them? On a career basis, do what you enjoy. Don't make going to work a drudge. Make it something you look forward to every morning. I, I get up at 5 a.m. and I'm in the office at 6 a.m. every morning. <laughs> and it's because I like what I do. Uh, I, what I really think I enjoy about the jobs that I've had is that it's, it's progressively integrated further and further by science and, under, of, and understanding of earth processes and geology with the business side and mineral economics such that I'm, I can, I, I now can ask the, the dollars and cents questions as they relate to what's likely to happen in the rocks. And in terms of make enough time, you gotta always make time for yourself. Uh, yes, you, you can get burnt out, and so that's why a couple nights a week I play basketball or softball. So, but you can still, <laughs> I can still work a 14-hour day and, and play two hours of a sport in the evening before I have a supper and go to bed. <laughs> wow. I just have, I make life fun is basically what I try to do. Are you a big coffee drinker? Or no? I don't drink coffee at all. Like me? I never learned how. I that's tasted, good. I tasted it when I was four <laughs> and I said, Same. Yeah. You're high on life. That's good. I'd be, I'd be dangerous if I had yeah. caffeine in me. I'd be forever bouncing off the ceiling. Yeah, yeah. No, I love the same way. Right on. Well, However, uh, I do drink my fair share of wine. Okay, yeah. That's all right. <laughs> okay. Bob Shaver, thank you very much. Oh, it's enjoyable. Thanks so much. It.